Welcome to the Renegade Reports. I'm Jonathan. And Roman is present. And Jonathan, last week we recorded just before the State of the Nation address. We did. And we said it was going to be pretty terrible. Yes. And I predicted more taxes and you predicted doubling down on state-owned enterprises. Both of us were correct. And they actually, no, created two new state enterprises. <laughs> like, they didn't just double down the existing ones. They want to create more. <laughs> well, of course. It's great. I mean, because more money to I don't steal. Know. Listen, listen. You tell me where they're going to find money for a sovereign wealth fund. You need wealth and you need to be sovereign, which we are, <laughs> we are neither. Because the commies control us. Mm. And then a state bank. I thought we had one already. It was called the Land Bank. And it went bankrupt like five times. Well, if they let them frack the Karoo, which they should definitely do, um, then there would be plenty of money for a sovereign wealth fund. It's too late for that. I, I, Oil is much not, cheaper not, now. No, Nuclear is no. easier to do. Fracking was like 10 years ago. And no, the bloody, we, should, we should definitely be fracking. And the bloody Cape Tonians frack the hell out of the Karoo until there isn't anything left in sight, which would be pretty much like the Karoo is now. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly Our pro Our guest that. is close from the crew. That's fine. We can decimate his homeland. I'm fine with that. Um, many things need to be done for the progress of mankind. Well, that's why he moved to the city. He's too dollars <laughs> to escape. So. But anyway. It's not offensive to me that you uh, that it's close to the crew. It's rather that you think the crew and where I come from is pretty much the uh, same There place. you go. That's what's offensive <laughs> for you geography bigot. <laughs> Do you, do you want to do an introduction at least? Geographic phobic. Yeah, no, we need go. a better word. Anyway. Yeah. I pretty much come from wine country and you compare it to a desert. So. Yeah. It was, <laughs> so you're from like Stellenbosch? Uh, close to 40 minutes from Stellenbosch. Yeah, see? Yeah. At least I'm like in the ballpark. That's man. close to the crew, isn't it? Anyway, Adam Spanzel, mm. welcome to the Renegade Report. Yeah, uh, pretty much back. Uh, I think two years ago for, was the first time I was here and I was calling in, not in studio. Indeed, because yes. you were still in the crew back then. And but being now, anonymous. <laughs> but now yeah. you have joined civilization, you moved to Pretoria. I don't know how civilization works there, mm. but it's more civilized in the crew. Not very well. Apparently not. No, no, it's Pretoria. I've been invited twice to Pretoria in the past week and I say... No, man. Yeah. Like, why? No. They've still got a grid system for their, their <laughs> roads. It's, it's, it's very 1960s. No, it's not... Uh, but Victoria really doesn't have all the angles that you guys have of the roads, though. Some of these roads have, like, weird... Yes, it's curves. called texture. <laughs> <laughs> right. Other than being in Pretoria, how's life? No, it's good, man. Uh, so, for example, I think most of your listeners already know um, I started working for Afri Forum since the last time we talked, and it's been pretty much now more than just I didn't know you worked for Afri Forum. I think we have to end the show here, don't we? <laughs> I thought it was like something benign, like? like Solidarity or something. Oh, damn. It's Afri Forum. Now we have to kick him out. Have you had someone from Solidarity <laughs> on the show? Um, have we? No, I don't think we have. No, not really. Every other Afrikaans organization, but not Solidarity. <laughs> You're welcome on the show, guys. Uh, anytime you want to come, we are, we're happy to have the conversation about unions. We did have a union conversation. With who? Um, ah, no, I'm not going to remember on the spot, man. Yeah. We've had 170 shows, but uh, one of them was union Almost based. 190. Oh. But anyway, Aaron, for those who might not know you, I listen. Yeah. So you work at Every Forum. Right. And you do what? Paramilitary training, <laughs> militias, arms no, dealing? I, I oversee the snipers firstly, and then on the side, I do a little bit of campaign. Do the Jews take instruction from you, though? I mean, this is the question I need oh, to ask. Oh, the Jewish snipers are still around. Well, the if you Jewish, go on Google Ju- Maps. Judith Malema insists that Jewish snipers are being trained. If you go on Google Maps and you look at the, the Afri Forum building, it's yes. actually built in the shape of a Star of David. So you okay. can connect the there dots. There you go. Of course, the Illuminati are real. Um, so what are you up to? So pretty much uh, I've started working in their campaigns department. And now that Aaron Sarutz and Monique Tata are in the US, uh, pretty much with an awareness campaign, I'm making sure this ship doesn't sink and staying on course. And that whatever messages and information they send from there is pretty much distributed here in South Africa. And this is what's pretty much now the big thing. And then, yeah, um, I'm to explain my post a bit more. It's working for the cam- I'm a campaign officer that specializes in content creation. So I create all types of content for, for Afri Forum, basically, on our campaigns. For example, I have a podcast on the Afri Forum website. I create videos. Um, I write opinion pieces and pretty much, yeah. So you basically do what we do, but you get paid for it. Mm. I think we're missing a trick here. Clearly, clearly we're, we're not part of the, uh, one of the, well, certainly one of the largest community groups in the country. Well, the biggest one by far. Surely. Every forum is, what, 230,000 members uh, now? We are the biggest civil rights organization on the African continent by like members. 235,000, yeah. It's 
pretty impressive. And those are paying members, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, unlike uh, members of a political party who mm. uh, who don't pay anything. Who just put it in their Twitter bio and that's their, yeah, their yeah. contribution. I suppose union members do get robbed. So that kind of is a payment <laughs> in a way um, and never really get anything out of the deal. So that, mm. that, 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 that may be a claim. All right, what are you working on campaign-wise at the moment? Well, at the moment, this month's focus is the US, the world must know campaign. It is pretty much... Oh, that's been quite controversial, eh? Because there's like uh, people on the left and the right who are kind of trying to uh, pick through this thing to sort of say, oh, there isn't a genocide, which I don't think is what you're saying. Is Um, that correct? I think two years ago already when I was on the show, I think I cleared that up. And that was even before I was working for Afri Forum. So I don't think I would have... There's no white genocide. Uh, No. Yes, okay. So um, please, um, if you missed that, uh, there's this cool function on YouTube where you can double click and then it will go back 10 seconds and you will see he said there is no white genocide. Um, But obviously there are problems. Um, Mm. So what is the campaign about? Well, the campaign is specifically about... uh this report that we we writ, wrote uh, the past few months, and that was a report on minority rights, specifically in South Africa. And I think some of the big ones are uh, linguistic rights, like, for example, Afrikaans being faceted out of education, and, uh, for example, uh, farm murders, and then also um, the double standards when it comes to media uh, coverage of hate speech against minorities, but also the institutions that are there to deal with hate speech against minorities not doing their job. Pretty much... To really sum it up in a very short way, I would say it is all the shit that's happened in the past 25 years in terms of the minorities being uh, abused or attacked or villainized by the government or its lapdogs, and it's summed up in 20 nice pages. Yeah, I actually took a a gander through it. Very well resourced, very well researched, and lots of sources as well. Mm, Thank you. I I was one of the people that I think I wrote six of the chapters. Well, kudos. Mm. I mean, thankfully they, they hired you because you're doing a good job, and that's that's very important. But it's it's a it's this weird notion that if every forum goes overseas or tries to raise awareness internationally, a you are trying to demean South Africa, and b you are not providing a solution. Mm. But both are very stupid arguments. But explain, you know, why South Africa can't be demeaned anymore i mean we're the laughing stock of this place um, well, but yeah uh, go ahead. yeah it's pretty much for me uh what i find funny is when you look at that interview that richard quest did about south africa where he pretty much berates the anc in south africa mm. south africans known love white supremacist richard quest <laughs> yeah. yeah no but that's the thing he wasn't like south africans didn't attack him they said yes this is great this is like shared mm. it everywhere and it was mm. pretty much a because it was a mainstream opinion sure but when it comes from afri forum then they have this preconception that no but they spread disinformation even though we're pretty much saying exactly what richard quest is saying mm-hmm. in, on, on a lot of issues and i think it's really just the the messenger in this case where there's a certain stigma connected to the messenger and then whatever we say doesn't matter Um, I always use the example of when Aaron Zarutz goes on an interview and, you know, he speaks to the same interviewer multiple times uh, often. And he goes back to this interview. The first time he he said, this is our stances here. You can see proof of what our stances are in these matters. And then the interviewer is like, okay, you changed my mind. Actually, that's not that bad. That's reasonable. Two months later, he's back on the same show. The interviewer is like reset back into that default factory setting mm. and he starts over again and Adams has to show him again like here it is and then he changes his mind and then you just repeat that ad infinitum sure, so Adams has the same interview for like 500 yeah. times in a row it's like a, it's like a political groundhog day but he's just doing the same interview over and over but again. let's talk a little bit about that stigma of every forum mm. weird question do you think some of it is I know you work for it do you think mm. some of it is warranted and I don't know well, if I agree or not with that statement. I just want to know what you before think. Before I started working for Afri Forum already, I had a, a theory on where this comes from. Mm-hmm. So there's a big fear of Afrikaners organizing. The whole idea of Afrikaners getting organized is a very scary thought for a lot of people because they instantly have like NAM flashbacks of uh, whatever happens when Afrikaners organize, but only the negative things and not the positive things. So, for example, look at what types of things are being attacked. All the places where Afrikaners traditionally organize. When it comes to, for example, the church, the Afrikaner churches are pretty much in disarray at the moment because of political meddling going on, in, going on there or just squabbling over political issues. Uh, 
Afri Forum and Solidarity, two other points of Afrikaner organization, uh, schools and universities, Afrikaan schools and universities, again, more points of Afrikaner organization. And you, you can dig into this as for 10 or 12 other uh, points of for the same point as well. But the central point remains that wherever Afrikaners get together and they practice their culture and they talk to each other and they talk about their problems, for example, the rugby as well, um, uh, the whole rugby culture where people get together and they talk about their problems, basically. It's a simple example of organization where you actually get a community then talking to each other about what needs to be done or what is bothering them. And then that's actually where a lot of plans are, are made in those types of contexts where they think, but we can do this and this. So I think there's the stigma around when, I, and to put it very bluntly, like when Afrikaners organize or get organized, bad things happen. And I think that's almost like a relic of the past. That's um, the, the, the or not derogatory term, but the term where they, that our critics always, or the, People that deride Afrikaners use it like they trek lar. They they creating a lar of uh, uh, ox wagons, and that was always a strategic uh, maneuver that the foot trekkers use. But then I always say, what is the lar in opposition to? It's not something that the Afrikaners just claim a hill and they go on top of the hill and they make a lager and they live there forever. They only do that when they are threatened or attacked by something or something existentially threatens them. So when you metaphorically see Afrikaners trekking lar, you need to start asking the question, but why are they doing it? It's like, for example, when you see the, the ants starting to uh, collect like pieces of wood and building their, their little nests out of it, you know it's going to rain. So when you see the Afrikaners collectively doing that, almost like there's a collective unconscious amongst them, you need to start asking yourself, but why is that happening? Don't you think that there's a collective feeling of a cultural threat or an ex existential threat felt by the culture or the group itself? And that's prompting this type of reaction. Okay, so, I mean, do you think that's healthy, though, in, in terms of the collective? Is there a danger that... Um and I think I think this is one of the concerns that you raise in terms of how people view things negatively. Mm. Um, you know, we, when we think of uh, maybe the EFF as a collective, mm. um, the concern is is that that collective uh, has certain beliefs which are very liberal, um, potentially mm. violent, uh, those kinds of things. And is there fair criticism that um, there's sort of uh, you know, put the Afrikaans collective together, it ends up being right wing, it ends up being these guys who sort of have plans to blow things up and, um, you know, that that's sort of the the, mm. the, the narrative at least, right. the societal narrative. Uh, no, uh, I would say, well, uh, it's a valid point that you raise. Um, I do think, because of course, again, I think I need to say that this, not stigma, but this feeling of worry regarding Afrikaners uh, mobilizing, I need to apply the same standard and say, but you also have to ask, why is that happening? As Exactly as the same reason I said, but why are Afrikaners organizing? And I think the, the main thing here that we need to understand is that Afrikaners aren't organizing as a political party like the EFF does around an ideology, but rather around cultural issues. The main, called, the main focuses of, for example, Solidarity and Afri Forum are cultural questions and cultural matters like our language, uh, our traditions, our communities, our heritage, our uh, statues and monuments and protecting and preserving those. And it's not an organization that is trying to be a political party. People always say, for example, that uh, why doesn't AfriForum become a, a political party? And then the, the, the best reply is always, but then you underestimate our ambitions in terms of, I think, in the modern world, not just in South Africa, you can do a lot more as a civil rights organization or even uh, like the model of the Institute of Race Relations, where you operate outside of the party model and you actually do get your hands dirty and do things for real instead of sitting and debating endlessly with uh, opponents that, quite frankly, don't want to hear what you have to say.
Yeah, or getting a very small piece of a set government pie, mm. which you'll always be a small part of and, and ultimately have no power. And in this country, who w- would want to be in minority government? Because it doesn't have any meaning. Yeah. Uh, the DA has been in government for 25 years and has done nothing. Uh, yeah. The only way they've governed, they've been able to say, okay, this is how we govern, in some cl- cases well, in some cases not. Yeah. But if you don't get majority government in South Africa, it, it has no value. Um until hopefully we get to coalitions, right? Um, if we ever get there. Yeah, if we ever, yeah, anyway. But, but um, eventually one day we'll say that book was correct, you know, coalitions yeah. country. Um, it's been a controversial sort of week, 10 days. Uh, we had F.W. de Klerk Foundation, I assume they speak on his behalf, yeah. uh, turning around saying um, apartheid uh, was not a crime against humanity. Mm. Um, I'm not sure I want to get too deep into the yeah. into the uh, reads on this particular topic because, mm. look, you cannot have this discussion mm. on social media. No. Um, and a lot of people want it, it to be said yes or no mm. as a, an answer to that question. Yeah. Um, uh, but there are there is a big, broad discussion to be had, yes. which maybe we'll have in future when it's kind of laying a bit low <laughs> and we can have a reasonable conversation. But also, uh, conversation. sorry to interrupt... Uh, I do think there is a conversation connected to it about a broad, broader theme. Yeah, so this it. is what yes. I this is kind mm. of what I wanted to get to, mm. you know, around yeah, around the broader themes about, around the th- the peop- things people freak out about yes. um, in the country and the things they don't freak out about in the mm. country or the problems they can see on one side and not the other. Yeah. So understandably a lot of black people become upset when you say it wasn't a crime against humanity. Um, because I think the view is is you're trying to minimize um, hmm. the harm uh, that that system did to black people. Hmm. Um, uh, but in the in the same context, uh, people don't realize why the Afrikaans community will get upset when a hmm. university turns around, which has traditionally been teaching Afrikaans for 50 years or 60 years yeah. or whatever it is, and turns around and says, we will no longer teach in this language. There doesn't hmm. seem to be a good reason for this. Or why um, there's such upsetness when a, when, a, when a minister or MEC of education um, focuses specifically uh, and so chronically on Afrikaans hmm. uh, uh, language schools, no. fake news is it up, uh, you know, lots of... Or when the ambassador of South African uh, calls all white South Africans rapists and uninvited guests in this country sure yes and they would, don't understand would, but no but it's true i'm like whoa <laughs> um, let's talk about that yeah but yeah no definitely and i think you i know where you're going because you summed it up in one of your tweets you said you guys realize that we are seeing the build the the build up to further crimes against humanity and it's coming from the ruling mm. party yeah i mean that's the broader discussion yes. i really want to have at some point mm. on this is it's funny how what things one side does want to see as crimes mm. against humanity and what they don't view yeah. as a crime against humanity. And I think that's where the discussion mm. is to be had on the legal definitions and yeah. um, that kind of stuff. But let's get back to, you know, Afri Forum and um, the Afrikaans community yes. and, and these, you know, it's all, it kind of fits into this minority rights mm. stuff as well. Yes. Um, I, think, I think what I find so interesting, though, is Afri Forum is very much what we push in terms of taking individual responsibility. Certainly it's a community doing it, and it is an inverted commas collective, Mm. but it's people taking individual responsibility going, okay, the government is against me. Um, In my opinion, government's against everyone, but the government's against me, um, and I need to do something for myself, so they donate to an organization like Afri Forum. Mm. When the university starts teaching Afrikaans, there's a whole discussion to be had on whether that's right or wrong. Um, and sure, some people are pro and against. The issue I have is then Afri Forum or Solidarity or any of these organizations turn around and go, we're going to build an Afrikaans university <laughs> with our own money. Yeah. We're not going to ask anything. And any it's going to be over help. there in the corner. You're not yeah, going to yeah. see us. We don't want anything from any yeah. of you. Don't, don't, don't worry. But the only thing we're letting you know is because we're building it, you have no control. Freak out. Yeah. What's that about? No, but that's the agenda revealed. That shows that it's not this, if you really cared about inclusivity or that this whole war on Afrikaans education is pretty much just so universities can be more inclusive and to benefit the, the uneducated 
uh, child in South Africa, then you wouldn't mind that private citizens are not taking taxpayer money and they're going to build their private education somewhere else. Those students are not going to public education, so they're not going to be draining state uh, taxpayer funds there, and they're getting their education in their mother tongue, which should... I would have thought be a no-brainer in terms of mother tongue education in South Africa this should be something to be championed, even if it's just little by little. You don't have to overhaul the entire education system right now. Just start laying the building blocks like Afrikaans did in the span of 100 years. Where I think, you know, I'm talking under correction, I think in the 1900s, Afrikaans and only two other languages were the only languages uh, in that 100 year span that went from like a basic level language to like an academic proper language. I think the other language was Hebrew and there was another other language that just that achieved that. And if Afrikaans can achieve that, why can't other languages also achieve it? But it wasn't, it wasn't something that just happened overnight. It was small building blocks. But then when you have someone like Le Sufi turn around and say, no, you can't do that, you building that private space for yourself that anyone that speaks Afrikaans is welcome. There is no racial uh, barrier to it. If you are a Asian Afrikaans speaking South African, you can get in there and you will pretty much not be, the doors won't be closed. I mean, you could get in there as an English speaking person, but yeah. you would have a problem with the classes because if you didn't understand fluent Afrikaans, yeah. you'd battle, right? Yeah. I mean, when I applied to do medicine, I applied to a, a number of places. But at the time, I didn't apply to Stellenbosch because at the time, it was they, they taught their classes in Afrikaans. Right. And then there were sort of the second string classes in English. And I wasn't mm. sure that that was going to sort of fill the gap. And so I just didn't apply there because it was mm. I would have failed, you know, in, in a language yeah. I didn't know very well. Um, I, I'm, it, it's, it is fascinating that there, there is such a, a pushback. Um, and it's to, so easy to expose. To That's what I find actually fascinating is that when you see, if you look at, for example, other type of types of agenda driven movements where there is actually an effort by governments to try and like uh, chip away at a certain group's rights throughout history, even today, it's always very subtle. It's very hidden. It's very much hard to prove in south africa it's out in the open it's just like yeah we're doing it what are you gonna do about it no they're not ashamed of saying and it's so. not even it's not even that yeah we're doing it he's like yeah we're doing it and you're gonna like it and you're gonna clap and but yeah. yeah uh that's pretty much it is that it's so easy to reveal the agenda and once you start really just paying a little bit of attention it becomes very clear about what's going on well, we had professor chris milan here a few weeks mm. ago and he talks about the sort of monoculture that the ANC wants to impose this sort of transformania demographic right. culture where every single element of society represents the demographics of the country. Mm. So any institution, business, like family. It's pretty much trust, racial beam counting. That's, that's all it is. Yeah. And if you don't toe the line, of course you, you're going to be yeah. attacked. But let's go back to, to culture a little mm. bit. Now, I heard you on Man Patria, which yes. is a very good. Uh, podcast. Uh, they are coming next. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would also highly endorse the, the podcast. Yeah, and and you spoke a lot about culture on mm. that podcast. Now, what is it about culture that's important? Like, how would you define it? And what is it mm. that sort of defines you as an Afrikaner and Afrikaners mm. generally? And obviously, this can be universally applied to the Zulus and the causes right. and the coloreds and as if the English liberals because they got no fucking culture. <laughs> well, that's what I uh, actually got into in, on the Manpatria podcast. Um, so if you want to know why English liberals don't have any culture, go check it out. I'm not going to spoil it. So for me, the, the big thing about culture is it's the glue that keeps communities together. It's the pretty much the, the infrastructure of a community. Um, it's the central flaw in why racial nationalism doesn't work because you can't unite people around just skin pigmentation. It doesn't work. You need something more substantive. And that's where culture comes in. For example, and I always use the example that when I debate whether it be black nationalists on the left or white nationalists on the, on the right, I always ask them the question, if you have a country like Botswana that has 2.4 2 million Chwanas living there, it's pretty much an ethnic state. It's 99.7% yeah. Chwana people. If you take that country and you import 1 million Germans to that, no, let's make it even more extreme. You import 1 million Zulus to that country. They're black. If you're a racial nationalist, you'd think, oh, it doesn't change the country in any way. They're pretty much, yeah, it's just now it's 3 million blacks living there, not 2 million. 
But that's completely wrong. That would completely and permanently change the politics and the societal fabric of that country. Because the, the Zulus will have a different culture, a different language, different political views, a different philosophical outlook to the world, even, if you will. And that's where the whole idea of race solidarity falls apart, but culture still stands. Culture is something more tangible. It's something that you can point to, that you can say, I can't remember... One of the Afrikaner philosophers said, on, there, were, there was this big debate in the early 1900s about what is an Afrikaner, what is a Boer. It was like this big purist thing. And one of the philosophers said, if you are an Afrikaner or if you are a Boer, you just know it. You know in terms of the way you live, the traditions you have, the little mannerisms, the things you have, the, the way you think you see the world. And culture influences the way you see the world it influences the way you act it influences the way you vote it influences the way that you treat people sometimes it influences the way that you interact with other people within your community and it influences how you interact with people outside of your community it pretty much is one of the linchpins to politics and intercommunity uh interaction in not just the modern world but for the past uh, recollection of human history and the thing about culture is that it's not, it doesn't go away. It, it always remains solidly there. So when you have, for example, uh, two countries fighting each other that are two black countries or two white, in the past when countries were pretty much 100% racially homogenous almost, you'd have to have a way to explain why these two countries don't just merge and become two happy neighbors. Why are they fighting each other? And England then in France. Yeah. You have to start stripping away things like that. And then when you start stripping away, in the end, one little thing remains, and that is two different cultures, two different worldviews, two different philosophies or ways of living that are competing and that are pretty much at war. And that's why culture is so important to me, because I'm not a radical individualist, as most of your guests probably are. I don't see the world as a, a collection of atom, atomized individuals, but rather as a collection of communities interacting with each other. Whether that community be linguistic, cultural, religious, it, you have a certain identity that is based on your culture or your religion, and and well, religion and culture overlap so and language overlap so incredibly it's almost inseparable that you get to a point where to deny that culture is one of the key cornerstones of someone's identity and then to claim that they're just an atom without that type of culture would be a very strange way of looking at the world so i mean i accept that and so if, if the world is comprised of communities or cultural groups interacting with mm. one another where do you draw the stance with your relationship with other cultures mm. if that makes sense this, i always use this example like the zulu conception of justice is different from my conception of justice which may be different from yours so it's it's strange to have a uniform legal framework Mm. So that incorporates, or well, that doesn't really incorporate, that imposes what justice is mm. on a variety of cultures and communities. But, for example, in you know, there's a utopia and the state of South Africa falls apart and yeah. cultural communities become mm. the most important elements. Yeah. How, how do you decrease friction between cultures? Because they're all as important as each other for yeah. the people that live within those cultures, right? Yeah. The way to reduce friction in, in South Africa, specifically from a cultural perspective, is to give your society pressure release valves, where instead of taking the apartheid route where you designate areas and say this is where your culture lives, you rather say the majority of this country, we're going to try and uh, create the, the Rainbow Nation of 1994. But here are certain designated areas where you can go if you don't want to be part of it. And you will not be arrested for it. You won't be charged with any type of crime. You can go live there if you, just want, if you don't want to be part of the, the Rainbow Nation project and you just want to be surrounded by your own culture, you can go live there. And the problem is we already have these types of areas in South Africa, but you don't have that type of area for certain cultures, like, for example, the Afrikaners. So, for example, take something like Urania. I remember two years ago, Roman, the first time we spoke over the phone, you asked me the question, what is one of your views that, other, that 
a lot of people might find radical or uh, strange. And I said, I think a place like Urania has a, a right to exist. And the fair reason for that is, is that that will be a space, for example, for a culture like uh, Africana to go if he does not want to be part of the, the bigger Rainbow Nation picture. And like I always tell people, when oh, I think Urania trends like three times a year in South Africa. Whenever that happens, I always my answer is always, look at where it's situated. It's there in the middle of the desert. 99.9 .9 to the, I don't know how many uh, <laughs> uh, value of South Africans will never encounter someone from Urania or won't even encounter someone that has encountered someone or walked past someone that has encountered someone in Urania. It's a town of, at the moment, 1,800 people. They just want to do or want to preserve their culture and practice their culture there in the middle of the desert where nobody wants to live. It's really not prime property. It is, I've been there quite a few times. It's a dusty small town in the middle of the desert. Doesn't mean that I uh, don't think that it is actually a pretty interesting place to, to live if you, if you, if your thing is that you don't value uh, the city life and you actually value your culture more. But yeah, I'm getting off topic. So the, solution for me for cultural friction is to give South African cultures those pressure release files where, they, where you can say you, we are going to pursue 99% or 90% of the surface of South Africa is going to pursue the 1994 vision if you don't want to be part of it, here are your spaces where you have more cultural sovereignty and you can do what you want special cultural zone, we yeah. special economic zones, you can have a yeah. special cultural zone yeah I'm, I'm not I mean so the problem with doing that is, okay, cool, we're going to give you this. No, no, we don't like that zone. We want that zone. Oh, no, that zone is uh, currently already, oh, no, we're going to need to move people. You know what I'm saying? The, the, mm. How does this change from uh, the situation you have in the Middle East? Mm. Uh, how does it change from people going, no, no, that's actually my spot. Get out of it. No, I mm. won't. Okay, war. Um, or ongoing strife, basically. No, that's a, a valid point, but I would then ask the question, well, first you need to consider the types of people that will be living in these types of spaces. The types of people that will be living there, and I can only speak from an Afrikaner's point of view. I don't know how other cultures feel about their own cultures. I can only guess or speculate. But from an Afrikaner's point of view, the people that live in Urania, for example, are willing to take objectively the shittiest piece of land you can find in South Africa, almost in the Northern Cape, where there's a drought at the moment, one of the worst droughts ever. It's a flat piece of land there's no scenery there's nothing it's just dust and this tiny little town that sees rain like i don't know how many times a year if you see that phenomenon you see almost two thousand people now that are willing to give up their life of luxury in the cities to go live in that corner of south africa for only cultural reasons, I think you and if other groups in South Africa view their culture in the same way, I think you would have people that don't care where this place is situated. They specifically just want to enjoy their culture. They don't care about the other luxuries of life or the the smaller things. So it's not going to be like, for example, um, uh, like you have in the Middle East, where you have groups that want their own countries or their own like controlled territories, but rather just areas within South Africa where you have more sovereignty over your culture, but you're still going to be South Africans. You're not going to have a government or like a... I'm just thinking, you know, how it would apply if the Zulus decided, mm. you know, we, we watch the Renegade Report often, um, the whole Zulu nation, of course, yeah. <laughs> and um, they, they decide, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. You know, pretty much KZN belongs to us, plus a little bit more, actually. Um, and that's going to be our spot. And we don't damn well care if this is someone else's spot. You know, I just, I just think on a larger scale, mm. when you're not talking 2,000 people in a desert mm. town, and you start talking larger groups of population. Yes. The other thing I, 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 that occurs to me is uh, South Africa is creating these situations, and by South Africa, I mean the government is creating these situations and the history in the sense that um, this is a very insecure country. Nobody mm -hmm. is secure within their culture, within their beliefs, within their personal economy, within mm -hmm. the greater economy, within their education. There's no security anywhere you look. 
Mm. Um, certainly in safety, that's, mm. that's, a, that's an obvious fact. Um, it's just there's no guarantees. Mm. And in society where there are guarantees, you don't need any of this that you're talking about. Mm. So the United States does not require special zones. The United yeah. States was called the melting pot. The left hates this, right? Yeah. Because you just, the problem with what, what you're describing that I have an issue with is it's almost an in, intersectionality of culture, <laughs> right? And I have an issue with that because the United States proves that you can run a liberal country, and I mean liberal in the John Lockean mm. sense, um, you can run a liberal country where people go home and practice Greek tradition yeah. or Lebanese tradition or whatever, um, but when they step out into the street, onto the subway, uh, into a coffee shop, they're Americans. Mm. And I think that South Africa has this, this problem, and it's a developing problem, and it's only going to get worse the more people feel insecure in the greater societal space. Mm. But the minute South Africa liberalizes, truly liberalizes, or eventually gets a right-wing government a la mm. Bolsonaro, um, the minute, the, until that happens, we, we've got this problem. Yeah. No, that, but that's the beautiful thing about America that I do admire about the Americans, that they have these little pressure relief, relief zones already, but not in the same way that I'm describing. Like, for example, like a Chinatown or a Irish district in, in New York where it's pretty much just Irish descended people living there. No one has a problem with it. The problem with that is, is that, yes, South Africa is going to have to go a long way if it wants to reach that point, if it is even possible to reach that point. Because you're not going to find in, in America uh, if there's, a let's say, a community there somewhere in uh uh, New York that is just uh, a bunch of Greeks and they are pretty much a Greek community is like a tiny Greece there you're not going to find an Irishman moving in there and saying I've got a problem with all these Greek restaurants around here and everyone's speaking Greek and looking Greek like you're not going to get that in the US people are going to laugh at that person and he's going to be kicked out in South Africa, that person's going to be a celebrity if he goes into that community and says, I don't like how this place doesn't represent South Africa. And that's because we've created, we've not created, we've, uh, we've pretty much idolized this culture and championed this culture of representativity in South Africa where everything needs to be representative because that's virtuous. Anything that's homogenous in any way is not virtuous. And I think... The only way that we're, going to, that we're going to get something close to what you see in America is if we break that paradigm of everything needs to be representative. But I don't see that happening very anytime soon. So, but yeah, um, well, maybe a final, final thought on that. Um, uh, I, I don't like the type of uh, wishful thinking of like when you asked... Uh, that type of question you get in high school, like, what would you do if you were president for a day? I'm like, well... Um, I'm not in any position to to discuss policy. And what I'm discussing here is definitely not uh, the type of thing that I would uh, want to write a policy document on. But it's it's an idea. It's the, the, it's the seed of an idea. And maybe people much smarter than me can build something on it. But yeah, that would be... My solution would be to, to give more freedom to minority groups in South Africa so there can actually be some steam that can be let off. Yeah, well, I actually think more freedom to everyone, really. Yeah, including yeah. minorities. But that's the thing about freedom. Once you're free, individually, as, mm. you, as a free individual, you will actualize in a community. Because that's yeah. what happens, right? That's but what see, people uh, do. I th yeah, in, in, in Philip Bass's book, I don't know if you... Well, it's an Afrikaans, so you're going to have to yeah. uh, struggle a little bit. But in his book, he says... One of the things that the majority always takes for granted is cultural rights because they think the whole the, the cultural rights is just thing that something that happens. Uh, the Zulu nation does not well they're not a majority. There's no cultural majority in South Africa, but a, a, a group like the Zulus, for example, don't have this the the same level of cultural anxiety that their culture is not going to be here in 50 years. The, and that is what I said on the Manpatria podcast um, uh, when I read Alistair Sparks' book, The Mind of South Africa. He said he understood the Afrikaners' cultural anxiety before 1994 because if the gamble doesn't pay off, he, as an English-speaking South African, can move to England, to Australia, to America, and he will be amongst his people, basically. They will not bry as much as South Africans, and they will maybe not uh, know where Durban is on a map, but that's he can live with that type of thing. Sure. It's not that much to give up, but an Afrikaner doesn't have that 
option. If you ask him, how would it feel if you had to move to a country where you're never going to speak your home language again to any person other than maybe your wife or your, your children? How would it feel to move to a country where you're never going to go to a church with your culture ever again? Where we, how would it feel to go to a country or live in a community where you're never going to see your traditions or your manner, not mannerisms, but like your cultural aspects anywhere? And it will just be you as you will become you and knowing and knowing if you're honest with yourself that your children or if you're lucky, their children will not have any idea of their history or, where, or their heritage or where they come from. They will pretty much from that point on, they will marry someone. You might still talk to your children in Afrikaans, but they will. There is a 99 percent chance they will marry someone from the U.S. or Australia or the UK and then their children will be completely assimilated into that culture and that tie to South Africa will then be severed forever except for maybe a tiny trivial uh, thing that one of your descendants might say at a dinner party is like yeah my ancestors were once uh, galloping around in South Africa but I think I have a solution for you what you need is an Afrikaans king <laughs> people look you're laughing <laughs> How, when do the causes, the Zulus and the Royal Buffalo King come up in the news ever when the king says something or a king dies, right? So what you need is an Afrikaans king having proclaimed things, having declared things on behalf of Afrikaners. The media will lap it up and you'll always be in the news because mm. now you actually have... No, it's half joking but half cunning at the <laughs> same time. But now you'll have a linchpin around which your entire community can gather around and make the news and declare things on behalf of the entire community. The only problem there is uh, Afrikaners are genetically wired to reject monarchy or any type of aristocracy. That's what there, our, our ancestors flaw. fled there's from. There's your flaw. Yeah. That's what we ran away from right. and pretty much gave a middle finger from. Monarchy is great. <laughs> More people should try it at least once. No, uh, I'm not even joking. Monarchy is uh, fantastic. We, we have no real functional monarchy anywhere in the world. Where, where is the functional monarchy? Iswati, functional monarchy. Iswati, Thailand. Functional. Swaziland, bro. It's they not like, functional, dude. It's very functional for it's him. Not fun well, it's functional for him, and that's about where it begins and ends, <laughs> and for his um, 16 wives. The worst monarchies um, are the ones in Europe where the bloody prince of Netherlands rides on a bicycle. That man should be shot in the street. I like agree with you. you that, how would you actually. choose he a, a carriage you. and a private jet? <laughs> how would you choose an Afrikaner monarch? Ernst Strutz. I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> You would probably have them like, well, uh, as we are, we would probably have like an arm wrestling contest and they would pretty much decide it's, it's it. It's all clear. Or well, like just a, a pipe smoking contest. And I'm not joking. Like that is probably how we would. Yeah, or, or one of those burrowers, <laughs> those brying contests. Best, man. best, poiki, best, yeah. best but no, yeah, best um, sheep catcher to yeah. shear them. I mean, now come we on. are doing this, serious, this stereotypical you can have, stuff. You can have the Afrikaner Olympics, which determines the Afrikaner king. Mm. Um, yeah, sports, <laughs> sports, and monarchy. In but on a day. on a okay. serious note, uh, you won't find another people on earth except maybe the Americans with as much a distaste or a disgust in terms of uh, when confronted with monarchy. Um, it's it's just something in Afrikaner culture. I mean, if you look at the royal family, I don't, I couldn't care less what they do. Man. Um, all right, let me let me ask sort of because I think. I think this comes up in the background. So Afri Forum releases a report that says, you know, minorities are being mistreated. Mm. And I think the subtext in a lot of people's minds is you have to be joking, right? <laughs> you are basically the minority that controlled the whole country 25 years ago, which in the history of time is not a long time. Mm. Um, and, you were a minority which was elevated above, and I would. Some people would be referring to white people overall, mm, mm. because of course, white all white people are responsible. Um, so those people, but then other people would be referring specifically to Afrikaners, right? And I think the subtext is: How can you complain about minority rights? Because this is kind of it's kind of what you had coming, right? It's kind of payback. Mm. Yeah, you ran the show for fifty yeah. years. Um, uh, there was this brutal um, uh, regime 
that happened as well. Um, and obviously, you know, there is the state of collectivization. All people of <coughs> X type were responsible. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can't now complain that you're the minority and you're being mistreated. Mm. It's, you know, what comes around goes around. I find it absolutely fascinating that the narrative has evolved from, for example, if you look at the, the reaction that we got against our report uh, when Aaron Sritz goes and does interviews and whatever. I find it fascinating that the narrative evolves always when confronted with facts evolves from no, your rights are not being uh, chipped away in any way to no, but you actually deserve it. Like, mm. yeah, it's happening, but you deserve it. Well, that, that's what like, I actually think if they were yeah. honest at least. But every time it, it, it starts off with denial and then when that is irrefutably uh, yeah. disproven, they always go like, yeah, but then you have to remember you, you have to remember you deserve it. And this is where this whole crime against humanity thing comes in for me. This is the crux for me. We need to understand that the ANC and the EFF are setting the narrative stage for EWC. That's and this is exactly what they're doing. The bigger the monster in the the the, tri the uh, window or the, the mirror of the car is that's chasing the car, the more red lights you are justified in running over and the faster you are justified in driving or the far, the, much, the more you can justify uh, breaking the laws of the road to get away from this monster because you keep telling people how big it is and how bad it is. And this is where we're getting now is that rather than, as we said earlier, rather than talking about the facts of whether it was a crime against humanity or not, which a lot of people seem to be saying that is the way the debate is. I don't think that's where the debate is. The debate for me is why is this happening? Why is this now after 25 years being discussed? Mm -hmm. Just like land. Land wasn't this big issue in 1994 or as it is now. But suddenly now it's being dug up again from the soil and uh, its corpse is being danced in front of everyone. And the same with like this crime against humanity thing. And the thing that I find the most interesting is that we, we live in this paradigm where we have rational, smart people that talk about, yes, I can't wait for this to end. I can't wait for the world to get sane again. I can't wait for people to stop virtue signaling or for people to stop this cancel culture. The next day they find a way that they can use virtue signaling or cancel culture to their own benefit and then they're on that, on that wagon. For example, with this whole crime against humanity thing, the day when that news broke or when it was trending on Twitter, you saw not the far lefties, not the, the radical possessed by ideology types, the normal sane people, a lot of people that I have a lot of respect for, rushing to Twitter to say something, every one of them along the lines of apartheid was, 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 was a crime against humanity, repeating it five times and then ending it off with something along the lines of, and if you disagree, you're a terrible person. Every one of them, hashtag the cleric, hashtag on the side of virtue, hashtag uh, best life or whatever. And then what happens is the next day, someone else virtue signals and they're like, oh, man, I can't believe this. I can't believe these people that virtue signal. It's really the most irritating thing. But as soon as they get a chance to do it, they do it. It's almost like you remember when there's like a global, uh, there's like some type of terrorist attack or something. And then everyone changes their profile pictures to mm -hmm. the flag of France or the flag of Haiti. And like, I'm, I changed my profile picture because I stand with the people of Haiti. That's the feeling I got with this whole crime against humanity thing with people rushing to Twitter to say, I am a white South African and I am saying it was and nobody can tell me otherwise. If you say otherwise, you are a bad person and I know it because I am a good person. It gave me that hollow feeling, that hollow feeling of I'm changed. There was a terrorist attack in Israel, so I'm changing my profile picture to the flag of Israel to show solidarity. I'm like, nah. no one ever does that for the reason. <laughs> yeah, no one ever does wrong, that. wrong country. But it's sort of like the Adam Habib syndrome, right? So just today we found out that he's moving to London. Yeah. Um, after how many years of push, pushing, we're not, uh, we're not Vitz for eight in total. Right. Um, but, uh, but the real lefty. But before he came to Vitz, actually called Afri Ford and the KKK. Mm. Uh, before, before he came John to Bolton. Vitz, he had a weekly column um, for many years, and he, you know, he he basically pushed ANC policy. Uh, was very supportive of the Mbeki government. Um, you know, and and frankly, before he was taken hostage uh, by the. Uh, by the students at Wits um, when when uh, fees must fall happened. Uh, before that, he was very much on the left, really, and and very much pushed a lot of that stuff. And even just before that, was pushing pretty much fees must fall ideology. 
and then got mm. taken hostage and treated like an animal, um, which is still kind of denied, but there's video of it. Um, and uh, subsequently, he, I think he learned the dangers of, certainly I don't think he's not on the left anymore, but he learned the dangers of the far left, at least. And there have been many changes at WITS as a result of him learning that, not least of which practical things like security, for example. It is far harder. You couldn't do, you couldn't do Fees Must Fall today on, on, the, on the WITS campus. Because what was happening at the time was there was no proper access control especially to the resers. So mm. w what was happening is in the evenings there was planning of the rioting um, happening in the evening in the resers with a whole bunch of people who were external who were then being bussed around mm. onto campus. Um, and a number of the violent things that happened on campus, um, no one was ever punished. And the reason for that is those weren't students. Um, they weren't identifiable because they weren't mm. actually students at the university. So there was a lot of stuff that happened there, and there was a lot of stuff that happened subsequently that he clearly learned from. But I do think that it is not unfair comment to turn around and say that a person who has pushed the kind of policy that puts South Africa into the position it is in today, both from an economic perspective and very many other um, you know, f factors, uh, health, um, mm. e education, all of these things, the type of person who pushed those types of policies and ideology, even in a soft way, like and a someone with an authoritative column. voice, sure, yeah. um, and a clever man, a very clever and a very competent man. Um, the kind of person who did that is now not going to live down that mm. heat. Um, and and you know we've seen CEOs of companies as well, so it's not just uh, who was that CEO? Life's life, yeah, yeah. life so, healthcare. Yeah. He was like, yeah, NHS is great, NHS is great. He resigned and moved to Australia like <laughs> literally two weeks later. No, he, has, he hasn't gone yet, but but he is he's going, going to Australia. He's yeah. going. So you see, no skin in the game, parasites. <laughs> and it goes to Australia. It's 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 really it's really. But what I, I try to, to be diplomatic. To... Ramon's just like straight for it. Eh? No, no. These people need to suffer for the consequences of their actions, and they never take responsibility. Just don't call them rats uh, jumping from a sinking ship. Parasite is a better name because a parasite could be a fish. Could be a tip. Could be the Oscar award-winning film. Could be <laughs> Oscar. Look, I, great film, by the way. You have to watch it. But Aaron, yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, 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 please, please. We know the ANC won't reform. We right. know EWC is coming, NHR is right. coming, all the glorious gulags are coming if you look different from what the ANC wants. <clears throat> what is AFRIFORM doing to, not prevent it, but perhaps, but like sort of how to, how to be anti fragile in this really sea of utter chaos? Well, AFRIFORM is like a sort of the, the, the shining light here. What what are you doing or what can be done? Well, or? firstly, maybe you should ask the question, How did Af why and how did AfriForum go in the span of 14 years from a nothing organization that nobody knew about to almost a household name politically? First question, because then you have to, or you're going to get to the answer that maybe we're making just enough waves and then also influence. Secondly, well, firstly, AfriForum is not a thing on its own. Uh, this is not a conspiracy. Uh, AfriForum was created by the Solidarity Movement because a, a labor union can't do a lot of the things that AfriForum does today. It would just be too overstretching. So they created AfriForum to fight on the civil rights front. And what happened, or what is happening, is that AfriForum is pretty much leading the charge with the support of solidarity in terms of organizing people in terms of their communities but making their communities state proof where slowly but surely you are creating a life raft for yourself on this completely chaotic ocean that we are adrift in it might not be perfect it might have some leaks but if uh, you're going to chop it up because it's not perfect you're going to be swimming there in the in the ocean and that's the, the big thing that AfriForum is doing because South Africa has 2.7 million Afrikaners and they are the main people that we represent. They can't all leave. Every year that goes by, less and less can afford to leave. Uh, the vast majority can't or won't. And those people are why AfriForum are here. And not just them, for the other communities around adjacent to the Afrikaners and also the regular South Africans that are being failed by the state. You'll see a lot of the private prosecuting cases that we take have no connection to Afrikaners at all, but it goes on principle. The, the principle of if this can happen to anyone in South Africa, this can happen to you. For example, uh, the Senzuma Yiwa case, very high profile case, and why are we doing it? Well, the thing, thing is, if 
if they can't even catch the killer of a high profile Bafana Bafana player like that, what chance does uh, little old Peter in the Moot stand? And that's the thing. Afri Forum, well, the first thing is Afri Forum is making communities slowly but surely state proof in as many ways as possible. Secondly, Afri Forum is uh, showing people that you can go against the broader zeitgeist and survive, come out the other side. It's like Andrew Breitbart said, where I'm walking into the fire so I can show other people that it is possible. And that's what you get through uh, every forum stances like what that you get from Kali Creole, from Aaron's Roots, or from myself, where we are taking stances that are counter narrative or counter zeitgeist and could be seen as controversial, but not recklessly controversial, just to show people that the Overton window doesn't have to remain as small as it is. There are places where it has shifted inappropriately where we can get it back to where it should be in terms of. Uh, just a decent society or a society that can be prosperous or a healthy democracy, even if you want to. And then the third prong or the third thing that AfriForum does might sound incredibly cheesy and it's going to make a lot of your listeners cringe because I know you have like a bunch of like age lord listeners that like the, the hard <laughs> shit. They want to listen to Roman talk about parasites and anarchism and burning the yeah. state down. Mm. But I'm going to... We don't have many of them, don't worry. <laughs> They're a fringe group. That's All great. right. Well, the third thing uh, to their dismay is every forum creates hope. It gives people something to hold on to, to tell them you aren't just a, a lone individual in this chaotic ocean. You're actually here part of a life raft with other people, and we're working together to create solutions. Those solutions aren't bulletproof. They might fail. Some of them might fail. Some of them might succeed. But at least we can tell people that you are part of a broader community of at least 235,000 people that are willing, just like you, to give their hard-earned money, whether that be 30 bucks or 100 bucks, to AfriForum and Solidarity or AfriForum or Solidarity every month to, for a common goal uh, or to protect the things that are dear to them, whether that be taking their safety very seriously. They, th that's why I always, when people ask me, why do people donate to AfriForum? It's like, well, for different reasons. Uh, some people, it's a hierarchy of reasons, but everyone has different things that they prioritize more. Whether that be their safety, AfriForum caters to that, that we have community watches. If it's uh, protecting their heritage, we have that as well. We uh, clean heritage sites, we preserve heritage, we actually uh, document a lot of the heritage that's been lost and we preserve that. If it's linguistic, we are creating things like Soltic, uh, that's more of the solidarity side, or Academia. Uh, Academia, the Afrikaans University that we started, uh, had a capacity, or they, they said that they're going to take 1,200 uh, learners this year, and they ended up taking 1,500 or around there. And these are just Afrikaans learners that wanted to learn in their home language. And then, for example, if you care about state-proofing your life on a more like fundamental physical level, AfriForum is helping communities pretty much uh, with water supply, electricity supply, all the basic things to pretty much, at the end of the day, make you so secure and state-proof that when the, the state comes and knocks on your door, you can give them a fat middle finger and say, well, there's nothing you can do for me. Okay, so to finish off from my side, you mentioned before how because the Afrikaans culture is so unique to South Africa. This idea of go back to where you came from hmm. doesn't work for Afrikaners. You know, Ramon will go back to France. It's no problem. <laughs> oh, hell no. Um, I'm going to, I'm he's going, going to back to the Middle East. I'm going to Morocco or Botswana. <laughs> All right. Um, sure. Uh, but um, so, you know, Morano, uh, Ramon will go there. Um, I, who knows, um, <laughs> I, I am South African, but I suppose, cool, I'll go back to Europe or go to America or the UK or whatever because I speak English and mm. I get what your, your point is in terms of yeah. fitting in. Uh, at least my language is the same. Yeah. Um, the Afrikaner may very well go, no, I, I have nowhere to go. And in fact, I know a number of Afrikaans people who say exactly this. I'm, mm. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. I'm not leaving because... There's nowhere else I want to go mm. um, and nowhere else that will fit with my mm. culture. Um, what does that uh, leave the prospects of the train that is EWC, um, expropriation without compensation, and the mm. train that is the Afrikaner who is not going anywhere? 
um, because oh. it's a very different situation to what we've seen in Zimbabwe, which is the common example mm. thrown up. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, uh, you know, they did it in Zimbabwe, and you know, the EFF guys will tell you that worked, okay? You know, because starvation is working apparently. But mm. even so, they'll tell you it worked. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of those farmers did leave, but they were English farmers who went back to the UK or other and countries. And they came to South Africa. The majority of them came to South so Africa. So a lot of them came to South Africa. So what I'm saying is what happens when you, those two things end up meeting? Mm. Is is this going to end up coming to the point of an armed struggle? Is it going to end up coming to the point of just, uh, you know, very obstinate communities mm. refusing to obey the law, going people mm. going to prison, becoming freedom fighters, inverted <laughs> comment. I'm not necessarily mean from a violence perspective. No. I mean, is there an Afrikaans Nelson Mandela in our future who refuses to get off his land and goes to prison for 30 years? Well, uh, I think you are asking the big existential question that solidarity and all the big minds of in Afrikaans and them are asking and have been asking for a long time in just different variations of it. I think what a lot of people underestimate that aren't Afrikaners or part of the culture is the rootedness that a lot of us, and you touched on it, the rootedness that a lot of us have to the African continent in terms of our identity, in terms of I, I've met so many Afrikaans people that aren't just not willing, and no matter how tough shit gets here, they are not willing to give up their, their heritage or their history. These are people that have been on this continent longer than most black South Africans have been in South Africa. Like the descendants of a lot of black South Africans are people that moved or immigrated here in the past 100 years. So the thing is, for me, for example, I've, my family's been here since 1688. I'm ninth generation South African. My family's been here in South Africa longer than America's been a country. For me, and I wrote a, it's unfortunately in Afrikaans, but if you are Afrikaans listener and you want more uh, expanded thoughts on my thoughts on this matter, you can go to Marilla Media and uh, just or just search um, the emigrasi vraagstuk in die prijs van a seal, uh, Aaron's van seil, and you'll because find no, it. no English speaking person is <laughs> going to search that. <laughs> no, and it's, well, it's pretty much titled yeah. uh, The Immigration Question and the Price of a Soul. And for me, it's the, the price is too high to pay. And I'm not the only person. Uh, a lot of these farmers that live on their farms, their families are buried there and have been buried there for a long time. But to get back to that question, and actually it connects to Roman you mentioned earlier that I made a video on my I don't know if you mentioned off air on air that I made a I have an Afrikaans podcast called called an Allah Arendt and I made a video called uh, is South Africa the next Zimbabwe and I named 30 reasons or 30 differences between South Africa and Zimbabwe in that video and one of the big differences is that in South Africa the minority is much more organized the minority of farmers because of the scourge of farm murders, it's actually in this ironic way or this Shakespearean twist almost, almost like in Macbeth, where trying to uh, force the farmers off their land or trying to threaten the farmers has actually made them very organized in terms of anti-crime units and stuff that they've created. So now in Zimbabwe, that was not the case. So in, so in contrast to in Zimbabwe, where you have these land grabbers that are going to, if they are illegal or state-sanctioned, when they go to take a farmer's farm, it's not going to be just that single farmer and his family as you had in Zimbabwe. You're going to be faced with an entire group of highly organized farmers that are just going to stand there and cross their arms. Whatever happens then, I don't know. That will be the big question. That is the big question around EWC is what do you do? How do you deal with resistance? I always find it so funny that... The narrative in South Africa, and you've probably seen it on social media, is don't worry, we'll do it peacefully. It's like, how do you peacefully steal someone's land? Um, that's pretty much a. How do you increase production <laughs> by stealing land as well? But yeah. the, the, just a final thought from mm. me on this, and I've bloody forgot my final thought. Mm. Well, uh, while you're it? remembering it, um, I mean, you know, you, you, how do you peacefully do that? And. For the people who say, well, the police will just come and do it. Well, the police can't stop someone from throwing a brick at another human and killing, yeah. killing them in front of them. So um, the chances of that, of that taking place in yeah. any organized fashion are highly unlikely. Um, yeah, it's, 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 
I think it's a grave concern. I think it's uh, certainly a justification for those who don't agree with, you know, Ernst and and whoever else goes on these trips to mm. the US and other places. Um, yeah. I think it's a justification for those trips because even if you feel that there's no justification right now, yeah. you have to understand where these kinds of policies have to end up. Mm. Um, it just it just isn't reasonable that. Um, we'll pass a law, and because we pass a law, people won't smoke in restaurants. Because no. we pass a law, people won't speed. Because mm. we pass a law, there'll be demerits on your license, and you'll lose it, and then you won't. Wasn't be a taxi there an ANC MP that said the EWC will be constitutional because we'll change the constitution or something like yeah. that? It's like mm, yes, yes. No, it will be legal because we'll change the law. There was and lots of journalists said that. It's like no, once it's changed, then it's constitutional. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. it just doesn't. No, the, yeah. the, my my final thing why mm. we won't be Zimbabwe in a traditional sense, maybe Venezuela, Afrikaners have never negotiated about their fundamental rights. No. In, in Zimbabwe, the farmers try to negotiate a hell of a lot before the mm. crisis actually happened. And I think that's the fundamental difference. Because the ANC, for all its faults, sort of respects you when you have a stance and don't budge from it. So they sort mm. of know where they stand with regards to the opponent or being say Afri Forum in this case yeah. and Afri Forum will never negotiate like some other organizations that say oh you can take like the small farmers but leave the big ones alone you know yeah. Afri Forum will never do that yeah so but but also yeah the position the ANZ changes the way it, mm. it wants to materialize but also on that same note uh, you also need to understand this is what I'm warning people about so actually a nice place to to, uh, to kind of wind the conversation down my big warning to people, especially the the white journalists that constantly smear Afri for it, there's a certain type of type of viciousness to specifically white journalists against other white people they don't like or find unsavory. You don't get nearly as bad like lies and absolute like smearing from for example black journalists writing about Afri for them. Yes, they might misrepresent us, might they might not agree with us. But not the viciousness. There's a certain type of viciousness there. But anyway, my warning to them is that you have this opportunity now to talk to AfriForum, which by every metric are actually very moderate. We, we want to come to the table. We want dialogue. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons why we go to the U.S. now, is we try to talk to the government. We, we, we wrote an open letter to Ramaphosa and said, we want open dialogue with you. We wrote a letter to Parliament and said, can we do a presentation on farm murders? That's all we want to do is we want to talk to you. And we got blue tick marks and we didn't get a reply. So then we said, okay, we're going to talk to America. Suddenly we get a reply from my ex back. Hey, hey, who's this girl? And what the position that we are in now is that there will come a time, if every forum fails, if we fail to preserve Africana culture, if we fail to put up a, an effective resistance to EWC, and Afrikaners are genuinely threatened, they will push us aside and say, well, we are done with the people that only want to talk. We want someone that does now, or doers. And it's happened in Afrikaner history where the moderates are, st are pretty much kicked aside because they didn't uh, get any progress. And that's my big fear could happen too. For example, and you could might happen from a different group as well, but from a, as an Afrikaner, as my experience within the, the culture, I can tell you if AfriForum, if you keep, just throwing roadblocks and stuff in AfriForum's way and you and you deliberately tie our hands behind our backs and we can't in any meaningful way resist EWC, some other group's going to take our place and, they, and they're going to say, well, uh, we're done talking now. Th these oaks like Adam's Roots that just talk and want to have dialogue and want to be respectable and civil, it's done. We don't want to. They're not, they're not getting anything done. And then you're going to know what a true far-right group is. And yeah. we're not going to be able to negotiate with them. That far-right group is probably going to see me as a traitor as well. And I'm yeah. not going to be able to change their mind. There's anymore. a lot of studies post-wokeness that, that shows that the more you talk to, like, say, for example, white people by white privilege, yeah. the more hardened they become and more antagonistic they become to the yeah. entire concept. It's the same with, for example, the whole... Uh, but, I mean, listen, you kick a dog for weeks on end and chain him up. One day he's going to fucking bite you. And you can't yeah. blame the dog when that happens. Yeah, and you see it in the U.S. now. I, I remember there was a New York Times, I think it was a New York Times article last year that said 
tolerance towards the LGBT community is the lowest it's been in like 30 years with amongst Generation Z. And it's because of that that political influence or that political meddling that's pretty much hijacked the entire movement, where it's no longer just, can we just be treated like normal people? Now it's like, you need to embrace it or you're a bigot. You need to fucking force your son to be gay or else you're a bigot, whatever. And because of that overstretching by a radical minority within the, the group, you get this type of pushback where people <coughs> harden again. And if you And the only way to stop that is for the people within that group, whether it be woke ideology or people on the left or people within the LGBT community in this case, for the people within that group or when it comes to radical feminism for women to push back and say, no, you do not represent us. You pretty much are a fringe group and we're not going to dance to your, your flute anymore. But we don't see that happening, which is very worrying because at the moment, as long as... Everyone likes a hammer when it's hitting their enemies, but when it's turned on them, then it's not so not so nice anymore. And for example, with this type of radical ideology, the left loves it because it's attacking their cancel culture. It's attacking their opponents. Their opponents are losing their Facebook pages. Their opponents are getting banned from social media. Their opponents are quitting social media because of the harassment. So then it's excellent. Then it's great. We love it. Until the day they get suspended or until the day... Outrage, the, their opponents realize, hey, outrage is actually a very, very useful tool. Hmm, I'm going to reverse engineer this and use it on my opponents. Then, oh, no, no, we need dialogue. We need to be civil. We need to cancel this right now. Cancel culture has gone too far. Let's get back to sanity. Suddenly, the entire thing changes. But up until that point, it was absolutely fair game. All is fair love, in love and war. I think that's a great conclusion. <laughs> it is indeed. And uh, if you are one of those online trolls who makes <laughs> their living out of going after people and their identities, uh, even though they have their identities, but their personal lives and their businesses and all the rest of it, uh, be warned. You that's all up, I've got to say. You could end up deep fried. Ooh, that's a terrible <laughs> pun. Oh, shocking. Cancel yeah, my that, mind. That was, that was horrible, <laughs> Ramon. Horrible. It's ended there, definitely. Definitely cut it. Um, cool. Uh, do you want to tell everyone uh, where they can find you? A few uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of your listeners already know, but if you don't, uh, if you search Conscious Caracol on Twitter or on YouTube, you will find me. Uh, if there are some Afrikaans listeners, I don't know how well you guys know your, your audience in terms of demographics, but of, if you are an Afrikaans listener, you can search uh, an Alla Ernst on YouTube if you want to listen to my Afrikaans podcast and just keep an eye on Politics Web and Marula Media for my opinion pieces that I write about once a month. Awesome. Ramon? Uh, you can find me on Morning Shot. Your daily jolt of news. Oh, sure. It's weird to talk about Morning Shot on this podcast. But yes, anyway, it is. But you're welcome to talk about it. Well, it's my podcast yeah, well, too, sure, Jonathan Woods. Sure, but we could, we could limit that. You Jews know? don't own everything. <laughs> Only half of this podcast is owned by Jews. Anyway. And, and Morning Shot, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have Morning Shot every morning, sometimes at seven. <laughs> always at seven except, Sometimes for, the, except seven. for when load shitting really screws me over yeah, but yeah. it's always at seven yeah. Uh, but yeah man cool. in the two years since I was last on it was a nice journey and it's nice to be back on and to actually be physically in studio to talk to you guys it was really fun no, it's always a pleasure Adam so you're always welcome and thank you for what you do I think you play an important role in this African political landscape and uh, if you give people hope then bloody hell let people be hopeful mm. it's good Good. All right. Uh, I'm at Jonathan underscore Witz, future VC of Witz, apparently. <laughs> and uh, this is the Renegade Report. You can find us on all our groups. Thank you, as always, for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers. <laughs>